Hey guys, how's it going? It's the team here at Authentic Mission, and we're doing another episode of Talking Liberty about minimum wage, and we're talking to... Gene Dalfour. Hey Gene, how's it going? I'm doing very well, thank you. So, um, I, I reached out on some Libertarian uh, Facebook pages, and I said, does anybody want to do a, um, a chat or an interview about minimum wage? And why, why it may may not be a good thing? I don't I don't believe it is, but let's let's discuss it and uh, we'll we'll go from there. For anybody that doesn't know, though, minimum wage in Ontario by twenty is it twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen actually? By twenty well, in twenty eighteen, it's going to fourteen dollars per hour from a current level of eleven dollars and sixty eight sixty cents an hour. And then on the January of 2019, it goes up to $15 an hour. That's assuming that the Liberals are still in power when that happens. Mm -hmm. um, well, I just saw a poll. Of course, polls are very skewed, but I saw a poll saying currently that they're neck and neck. Uh, the Liberals in Ontario are neck and neck with um, the PC, the, the Progressive Conservatives. So... Uh, hopefully it doesn't go. Um, um, hopefully I don't. I don't want the minimum wage to go up, and I have my reasons why. But um, you you reached out to us, and you you explained how you had a little bit of a business background, right? And that's why you you have some knowledge about this. Yeah. I've worked in the business community for about forty one years now. Nice. I've also worked as a professional recruiter for about 35 years, and as a professional recruiter, I have placed uh, thousands of people into jobs, various kinds of jobs, and all of those jobs were negotiated one-on-one -on -one between the employer and the employee. Mm -hmm. But also, I've been a libertarian for 10 years, and I've, been, and I've studied extensively the Austrian School of Economics, so I have a very strong ideas about labor policies as they pertain to the the two main uh, principles that the libertarian movement are based on and I can talk to that if you'd like yes please hello so how would you like me to proceed I can talk about this theoretically I can talk about this practically I can do both if you want to address it later well how would but, you like to proceed well I I, I would say the, the best way to, to make it for the um, easy to understand for the audience is the fact like I, I spoke to you privately on the phone about my uh, how I was telling my friends that this is not a good idea about minimum wage and they're going are, right. you, are you crazy the cost of the, we need it and I'm going no but you explained it the best way to me over the phone so maybe start with that okay well, if you look at microeconomic theory, so this is when you study economics and you study the variables that go into a business in terms of its operating costs. So, for example, if I'm a manufacturing company, I, and if I'm running that company from a financial point of view, I have a number of categories of cost that I need to manage to be successful in delivering a product to the marketplace. One of those categories is labor. And of course, another category is capital equipment or machinery. Yeah. Another one would be energy. And it goes on and on. But most organizations today, when they face labor costs that are beyond what they can pay in the marketplace, they effectively have two options, one maybe three. One option, of course, is if their labor costs are too high relative to all the factors of production that they need to make their objectives and to be able to come to the market with a product, they, they would need to either reduce the wages they're paying to people so they can or at least contain them so they can keep them within a, a, a cost structure that they can afford, or if the wages go up because of regulatory changes, then they can reduce the uh, the number of, the, of people that they will hire and put more pressure on the people who remain to do more work for the same amount of money. Or they can close down their business because they no longer have a business model that will work and they can't stay in business. Mm -hmm. 
or they could move to another jurisdiction where labor costs are not causing them to uh, to go through such such very dramatic uh, situations. So these are the, the main options. And if, if you look at the history of manufacturing in Ontario, you'll see that we've lost an awful lot of manufacturing companies over the year, the last uh, 15, 20 years. Yeah. And factors of production such as energy costs, which of course is a big topic these days, but also labor costs are a big, a big element for that. Yeah. It's a big aspect to that. So we've lost companies because they can't afford to operate here and there are other jurisdictions in places like Mexico and also in the United States where it's a more attractive business environment for companies to make investments and to hire people and to deliver product to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I saw this... Is that uh, right here? Pardon? Was that clear enough? Or? Yeah, for, for me it was. Um, I, I've i really grown to understand it. And, and I guess I can say I, I basically understand it in the most uh, layman's terms possible, which is everything you said. But I also noticed yesterday a, a story on, a, um, on the CBS News about somewhere in the States the minimum wage was going up to... Eleven dollars from seven something, and okay. this, this family-owned restaurant, uh, the guy that owns the restaurant was saying, like, I've already had to cut back to only serving lunch two days a week. My burgers are smaller. Um, you know, like this is a family-owned business that I want to pass on to my children, and I don't know if I can do it. And their their governor right. in that state said that they're actually going to be reversing the minimum wage. So I, I think that's important for people to know that if they can do it in the States and reverse minimum wage, then they can do it, they, they can do it here. Because um, it, it's only... I don't, know if you can legally, I don't know if you can legally reverse the minimum wage because the minimum wage is being established by government edict. Okay. So for, if they're doing that, they're probably doing it against the law. They're paying people under the table who are willing to work without. Uh, maybe they're paying cash, for example, so that there's no there's no uh, audit trail to show yeah. that they're not complying with government regulations for minimum wage. I mean, the, the black market is another option. Like the people will go to the black market to find people and hire them under the table at whatever rates they'll go for. But yeah, but uh, that's not likely to be very common in, in a you know legislative state, state like Ontario. Mm. Well, but, you know, Stephen, there's a more fundamental, there's a more fundamental way to look at this issue, and I'd like to, I'd like to bring this topic to you so you can, uh, uh, so that we can discuss it. Sure. Is that okay? Sure, absolutely. I'm a sponge. Okay. <laughs> so, are you aware of the two fundamental policies that make up the basis for libertarianism? Do you know what they are? Uh, individual choice and individual. Um... Uh, liberties and, and less less and less government involvement, you know what I mean? Did that sum it up right? Okay, well, no, it's, it's more specific than that. Okay, cool. All right, so what it basically says is that we we believe in individual property rights. Right. All right? And we also believe in the non, the, the do no harm principle, or the non-aggression principle. Yeah. So I'm going to explain both of these to you because both of these need to be understood by people before they can understand libertarianism. Okay. So property, the way I define property and most libertarians define property is we define it in four ways. Mm -hmm. And one way is your body. So your body is your property. So, so when you get up every morning and you feed yourself and you bathe yourself and you dress yourself and you go out in the world and do what you have to do, you are the only custodian of your body. Yeah. And that is the truth for everybody. And so that is a, a, a form of property. And so because you have a body and you're the only custodian of that property or that, that body, then you then that's property ownership. Yeah. The second part is your mind. So your mind, how you your brain, how your brain uh, and thinks, that's another piece of property. Because you're the one who studies, you're the one who reads, you're the one who accumulates knowledge and accumulates skills. Yeah. And no one else is doing that for you. You're doing it for yourself. So you're the custodian of your own intellectual development. So that's also your property, your mind. Mm -hmm. The third area is your effort. So your effort, you 
could have a very brilliant mind and you could have a very powerful body, but if you don't apply it to anything, then of course there is no effort and, and so nothing will get produced. So your effort is again a choice that you can make to decide whether or not you want to use your mind and your body to produce something, either for yourself or somebody else. Yeah. And then the fourth area of property is the assets that you acquire as a result of applying your body, your mind, and your effort, either for yourself or for an employer who's willing to pay or exchange their assets with your effort. Yeah. So, in essence, those are the four dimensions of property rights. When you apply that to labor, if I come to you and you have a job, and, and I'm the person applying for that job, or one person applying for that job, then I bring into that transaction my body, my mind, and my effort. That's what I'm bringing. That's my property. Yeah. yeah and I'm the sole owner of that property. You, on the other hand, are a business owner. And so you, you have created a job, you define that job because you know what that job has to do to benefit your business. You're paying for that job out of the assets that you've accumulated in other parts of your business in the past or for your own earnings. Yeah. So you're exchanging your assets for my body, my mind, and my efforts. Yeah. Now, when a government comes in and, t and tells you and I both, we're both property owners. I'm the property owner of my body, my mind, and my effort, and you're the property owner of the assets that you're willing to exchange for what I'm offering to you. Yeah. Where a third party like the government to step in and tell you what you can and cannot do under that arrangement is, is, is as far as I'm concerned, is, is immoral, unethical, yeah. and should not occur. So whenever you get a minimum wage law that comes out and the government states that you as an employer have no obligation, no choice, but to, who are obligated to pay $15 an hour for wages. Yeah. Otherwise, you cannot hire someone at the minimum wage level. Then that, to me, is a violation of your property rights. It's also a violation of the property rights of every willing employee who would work for less than $15 an hour. Yeah. So from a libertarian perspective, the minimum wage law is a violation of everybody's property rights. Yeah. That's is that clear? Oh yeah, that's clear. That's very clear. Okay. Um, I, I basically, um, like I'm a growing libertarian, so I'm not, if somebody tells me, well, what is it? Sometimes I gotta, uh, I got, I gotta prepare myself mentally to explain it properly. That's why when, when I said it the first time, it was kind of wonky. Um, and, and one, okay. one thing that, that upsets me though too about this minimum wage thing is, and I, again, I'm just learning all this too within the past year, um, is the problem that like they've also updated the labor codes and if you've been working for, if you were working for me for five years, I as a business owner right. am supposed to give you, I think it, I think they said three weeks paid vacation. Now, I'm not against people getting paid right. for vacation because of the good job they've done. But what if we mutually agree, okay, I'll give you two weeks paid vacation or I'll give you a week a week uh, in the first six months and I'll give you another week in the last six months of the year, fiscal year, because that's all I can afford. The, the labor codes or the labor um, laws should all be, like you said, agree or like you Basically, like you said, it should all be agreed um, amongst the two parties involved. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like it, it, and that's it, where it violates the second principle of the Libertarian Party, the non-aggression principle. Yeah. So when the government steps in and says that you must increase the vacation period from two weeks to three weeks, then they're using force. They're yeah. using legal force, and a legal instrument of force is a regulation. And once they pass that regulation, they have the force of the government, the police officers, the courts, the judges, the entire bureaucracy is there to enforce their regulations. And, and that word enforce includes the word force in it, so there's no mistake about it. It's, a, it's an act of force against yeah. individual citizens and individual business owners. Yeah. Again, wow. they're stepping in and violating your property rights mm -hmm. and using force to do so. Well, what people don't realize is 
this is gonna kill um, this is gonna kill small businesses at least some of them hello hey. okay so so, why, so why do you think the, why do you think the government is doing this what's what is the gain for the government for doing this tell me I think it's all what very, do you think? I think it's all very suspect and it's very she's doing it because Kathleen Wynn's doing it because it's close to an election. She screwed up with electricity, so now she's trying to put a put a band aid on by 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 saying, "Well, we're going to increase your your living expenses because we didn't know how to manage our books, and we we increased the cost of electricity." In my opinion, so basically, because she put okay. the cost up, she's putting because she put the cost of living up, and the government puts the cost of living up with inflation. Then. Okay. Now, now they're increasing minimum wage to make it look like, oh, we're helping you. But they created the problem in the first place. That's right. So we as taxpayers always pay the penalty for every mistake that the government uh, makes. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Exactly. Right. Because I mean, here's, here's my take on it. Okay. Okay. So my take on it is this. The labor unions in Ontario, especially the public service labor unions, are in Kathleen Wynne's corner. Yeah. And what they've done is that they worked out an arrangement, a backroom deal, so that Kathleen Wynne will pass policies that will benefit the labor unions. Now, how does a labor union benefit from an increase in the minimum wage? Because it doesn't appear to have anything to do with the wages that are offered by labor unions. Okay. Well, the way it does is it turns out that the the rates that the labor unions can negotiate are measured against the rates of the minimum wage in Ontario. So if the minimum wage goes up in Ontario, then the, then the next time they go to the negotiating tables, there is a formula that ties their, their wages to the minimum wage of Ontario. And if it goes up, theirs will go up too. Yeah. Now, the reason why this is important is because the labor unions are under the control or under the heavy influence of the labor union leaders. So the labor union leaders at every election, what they do is they, they get their members, as many as they can, to get out and vote. And they direct their vote towards the party that's given them the best deal. So, for example, if there are, say, a, thousand, say a million uh, union workers in Ontario, let's just pick out that number, right? a million. Yeah. If, if you, as a leader of a labor union, can get out 90% of your members to vote, and if the general population only comes out at about 45% to vote, which is about the case, yeah. then organized labor is getting twice the voting output of the, of the regular citizens because they're organized. Mm -hmm. So it's all about pandering to the labor unions to get them to organize the vote so they can get as many people as possible to support the mandates that have been negotiated between Kathleen Wynne's government and the labor union leaders. That's the name of the game. So if you haven't figured this out yet, Stephen, the only thing that matters to any politician are the votes, and money is yeah. only the means to buy votes. That's all it's for. Exactly. For them, votes is everything, because if they have no power, they have nothing. Well, personally, um, I... I don't know. Politicians think they're above the law, basically because they they, they they make the law. And I'm surprised Kathleen Wynne's still there after the whole, um, you know, uh, Andrew Olivier thing in the in my town of Sudbury. But I mean, that's a whole other topic. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there's there's a lot of reasons why she should have been in court and and tried in a court of law. Many reasons why she should have done that by now. But you're right. I mean, she's in the privileged class. A, a public servant is in the pri privileged class. If they make a mistake, they're absolved of their mistakes because they're a public servant. Mm. And, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why you don't find too many public servants who are getting thrown in jail for their mistakes uh, or political leaders because they're protected. They are a first class member of society and everybody else that's not part of the public service is a second class member of society. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the union thing, like I think that there, you know, if the company is big enough, then 
maybe maybe my opinion on this will change because as I said, I'm a growing libertarian. But when it comes to the union, right. when it comes to the union stuff, I think that all the uh, all the employees of a place should go together instead of having like a group that they. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't a union basically a you hire a group to represent your your supposed needs or whatever, right? That's basically what a union is, right? Instead of the individual... No, the, yeah, the union represents the workers. Mm -hmm. And they represent them in a collective bargaining scenario. And, and out of all your union members, everybody is unique. So some people have got more skills and they're worth more to the employers and some people work less. It's just the nature of the beast. We, every human being has got different attributes and different capabilities. So to, to put a person into a category, mm -hmm. in a category where there might be 100 people in that category, some of them are top performers and some of them are people who barely should hold on to their job, to pay them all the same, to me, makes no sense whatsoever. But to me, to have a collective bargaining unit, in fact, is a violation of property rights again because they use collective bargaining as an instrument of force yeah. that has been granted by the government, so the RAND formula, for example, I mean, the RAND formula was, was created somewhere in the late 1940s that gave labor unions the power to, to, uh, to uh, make people who are working in a workshop, to make them, force them to become a member of that union. It's a condition of employment, so if they don't become a member of that union, they lose their job. That's true. It also forces them to pay. A, they also force them to pay membership dues. So again, that's a force, and if it's a force, that means it's a, it's a forced taxation. So it's a labor tax yeah. on the on the union workers. And I don't know where you know I, I don't know where I saw it. There was no laws that I ever saw that gave union leaders the power to tax. That was only government, as far as I knew. But as it turns out, they have the power to impose a membership due or a tax on their very employees or their very workers. But finally, in the end, they they have the power to withdraw the services of that labor force, and that can that can damage the reputation. It can damage the assets of a company. It can it can harm a company. And the libertarians do not believe in harm. We, do not, we are a do no, do no harm organization. So so if a labor union is granted authority by the government to harm a business owner. That's yeah. immoral, that's unethical, and it should not be happening in this country. Yeah, I agree. Um, and as far as I've seen, like, there's one union that I know of where it's a union for um, uh, PSWs. And as far as I've heard, that union barely does anything to, like... I know of someone that went to the union and said, my boss is being a jackass, blah, blah, blah. And, and the union was like, sorry, there's nothing we can do. So if they're not going to legally help you challenge the boss, because maybe the boss is being a jerk. Let's face it. Not all bosses are nice, right? So if, right. if he's going to pay into this union dues and they're saying, well, there's nothing we can do, just document it all. Then what's the sense and pain into it, like you said? Because they're not they're not helping them. They oh, just my said, wife, yeah. my, my wife was a, was a teacher for many years, mm -hmm. and she had to pay union dues to be a teacher, even though she did not want to be a member of the, of the union. She had to do it. She had no choice. Yeah. Later on, she became a principal and a vice principal and then a principal, and she had to deal with the uh, the labor issues all the time. And I'll tell you, they were very very. Uh, very, very unproductive. They're not in the interest of the students at all. They're only interested in themselves and bettering their own situation. Yeah. That's why I, I don't believe there should be a union anywhere in the public sector. There should be, people should be hired one-on-one, -on -one, like every other company. I, as I say, I've spent 35 years putting people into jobs. I never put people into a collective bargaining bargaining union. It was always a one-on-one -on -one negotiation. And for the rest of the world, it works extremely well. Yeah. But for the government, they're a monopoly, and the union is a monopoly upon a monopoly. Yeah. They have, they're basically a parasite that lives on the back of the, of the government monopoly, 
who are in business within a monopoly, and they can get away with murder, and they do. Yeah. Well, what brought, um, for a little bit of a history lesson, if you if you know this, then uh, then yeah. maybe you can help us out, and if you don't, then I'll just tell the audience to look it up. But what basically brought, uh, from your perspective, what brought unions in? Beside, like, was it besides what you said? Was it because people were getting like? Because I saw this one uh, TV show just this week, which coincidentally <laughs> was about the first NDP leader, Tommy Douglas, and it showed right. like, the this group of miners getting beaten by the police because they weren't they wanted to uh, they wanted to form a union and whatever. So of course it's gonna it's gonna take of course the show was gonna take a socialist view, but but was it because right. some bosses were being abusive or was that just a false narrative or was it a little bit of both? We're dealing with human beings, and I'm sure there were cases where there were some bosses that were not the best bosses in the world. But the reality is, is this: is if you look at the progress, economic process, and progress. The standard of living progress that we've experienced in Canada since Confederation, 150 years now. <clears throat> yeah. The standard of living has steadily improved. The quality of life 150 years ago, 100 years ago, or not anywhere near what it is today. Yeah. We are by far and away wealthier than we ever would have imagined 150 years ago. So there was a time in Canadian history, especially in the early days of industrialization, where people left the farms and they went to the cities and they got jobs in, in, in factories. And they did it because farming and subsistence living in farming was, was less attractive to them than going to a factory where they could at least get a regular wage. Yeah. But you know, the companies back then, of course, they were trying to do what they could do to compete and to be able to deliver a product to the marketplace. So they couldn't pay everybody tons and tons of money. They could only pay as much as they could afford. Yeah. But, and they did. But the other thing about factories that most people forgot, and this goes back to the days of Karl Marx back in Russia, is that back in the day in Russia, when Karl Marx was around, it was a farming community. About 90%, maybe 95% of the population was living on farms. Mm-hmm. That would be true in Canada, too, probably about, uh, about 150 years ago. And so they, the, only, the only income they got was whatever they got out of the farm. And so it, it farming could be very tough back in those days, very, very difficult life. So as we started getting more and more production through machinery, what people keep kept forgetting is that there was an investment that the owners of those businesses must make to be able to make the average worker more productive. So when they built a factory and they put machinery in that factory, every worker could produce much more because they had the leverage of a, a piece of machinery that enabled them to be more effective, to produce more product with the same amount of effort. So we continue to do that. Our productivity as technology grew, our productivity grew. And so you look at the level of productivity for a single person today compared to the productivity of a person 150 years ago, and there's absolutely no comparison. But all of that is because every person today is being leveraged by technology, and that technology costs a ton of money. It's very expensive. Um, I've been running in a business, a consulting firm, for the last eight years as a director. I know what it takes to run a business and the costs involved in that business. And and most people don't see that. They don't know what a business owner needs to do to be successful. They only see the results. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really, uh, we, there may be a, a time when when people, you know, labor unions came about as politics. So if you can, if you can organize enough workers, if you can order, organize 50% plus one, workers in a plant based on the, the rules from 1940s. If you could do that, you could organize a union. Mm-hmm. And if you go to enough people in the union and say to them, I'm going to make your life better, you vote for me, you support me, you join my union, I'm going to make sure that we get more money out of this this, uh, this owner. And so they began to use the collective bargaining and they used violence and they used a number of other things to try to move their, you know, to move their, their, uh, their agenda further. But today, Look at the working conditions today. You know, look at the public servants that you know today. Do they do they work in places that are dangerous? Do they work in places that are unsafe? They don't. But they have no reason at all to complain about their workplace 
work conditions, the, the tools and machine and equipment they've been used to do their job. No reason whatsoever, but they're still doing it because politics enables them to do it. Because politicians like the NDP and the liberals will go to them and make promises, and so they will vote for them so that they can leverage even more from the taxpayer simply because they can politically. Mm -hmm. No other reason. Well, that, um, that, that about sums that up. Um, now, for, for all the uh, listeners out there, I just want to tell and tell you this story too. Um, there's, a, there's a franchise here in, in town that right. there's, a, there's a woman that bought into a, a, a food franchise. Okay? Their, their prices right. are all set by the, uh, fran like the head franchise or whatever it's called. Their prices are all right. set. And she already said, our prices are already set. And just with the 50 employees that I have, this is going to cost me, I think she said, an extra $4,000 a year. I don't know what I'm, I, I don't know if right. I'm going to be able to keep both my franchises open. So that's, that's one example of how I was saying this minimum wage thing is going to kill small business. And we're well, like I said, that's a violation. Of, that's a violation of her property rights. Yeah. And the Libertarian Party would be backing her to go against the government to stop them from aggressing against her business and her private property. That's what we would do. Now, do you think there's any chance that this won't happen? Like the minimum wage? No, it's it's going to go through because the the the, the raise to to um, January. Uh, 2018 will occur during Kathleen Wynne's current four-year uh, term mm -hmm. because we're not going to the polls until next June. So we will be at a $14 minimum wage yeah. by, yeah. by January. To get to $15 will mean that the, the next year they will have to still be forming the government. And I'm hoping that the Kathleen Wynne goes down in flames. You know, it's time to get rid of those liberals. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I uh, not in the last election, but in the election before that, I before I learned about um, libertarianism and everything, I did vote for Kathleen Wing because no matter what, I still find pride in my in the right to vote. We have the right to vote in Canada. Now, had I known what I know now, I wouldn't have voted for her back then. You know what I mean, but right. I, I'm a I'm a disabled person, so uh, you tend to feel like okay, the government's gonna, you know, the government know. At least at the time, I was like, okay, they know what they're doing. I'm not voting conservatives because my my view on conservatives was they're they're uh, they don't care about. You do need to care about the little guy if you're in politics, at least a little bit. So that's why I said to you before in our conversation, like being disabled, we do need to set up systems of empowerment and there is a need for some social programs like ODSP because I was born with a disability. I, I'm not milking the system because I can't, because I don't want to go out and work. You know what I mean? So, so yeah. the, the ironic thing mm -hmm. about all of this is I, like I said to you before, currently I, I get funding for my, my teammate that helps me do these videos, helps me write my articles on Steemit and stuff. And um, my funding is the equivalent to $10.50 an hour. So right now it's already under minimum wage. Now I've been on the phone with the ministry for the past month calling them and going, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. If you're going to increase minimum wage, what am I going to do? Because my funding is going to run out faster because by law in that program, I still have to pay my teammate minimum wage. You know what I mean? So yeah. this is, again, creating more of a cycle of a system of dependence. And that's what sucks. <clears throat> so what happened? Here's, what, here's what's going to happen. So if this happens then you probably will not be able to afford to do this anymore. So that means that something that's productive for you, that's creative for you, that's helping you develop skills and abilities, will yeah. be taken away from you by the government. Exactly. At the same time, the person hired now for $10.40 an hour 
he won't be able to afford him. So you put him as an unemployed worker. So that will that will be another consequence of what they're doing with the minimum wage law. Mm. So these are things that are that are they they say unintended consequences, but the reality is, I don't think anything is unintended for the government. Well, I think that they are pick, they're picking groups and they're yeah. trying to win the votes of certain groups. Yeah. And they know that they can do that, and so they they pander to those groups, and they do not care about anybody else. They do not care about you. They do not care about your worker. Yeah. They only care about getting the votes they can get yeah. from the group that they're trying to support, which is probably the unions. Exactly. And, and I want to I want to give you a little food for thought here. Think back to any okay. election that you can think of. When have you ever heard? Any politician say this is what I'm gonna do for people with disabilities, whether it's it's uh, uh, more accessible buildings, whether it's more accessible transit. You never ever whether it's municipal, federal, or provincial. I've never heard from a politician this is what we're gonna do for people with disabilities. You know what I mean? You know why? You know why? Because they want to keep us on. Why this. I, because they want to keep us on that system of dependence, that's why. And that's part of it, but there's another reason. Think about it. Because our vote really won't make much of a difference to them, I'm guessing? Or is there another one that... Because there's probably, there's, probably, there's probably a not a large enough pool of voters in that category that will support them. That's what they want votes, you got to understand it. Yeah. They want votes, and if they don't see the disability community as, as, as being a viable choice for a sufficient number of votes, mm -hmm. but think of it this way: you've got you've got a disability community, yeah, and you've got a let's say a labor union community, right? The labor union community is organized, so you know you can get the leaders to get out there and get maybe ninety percent of the voters in that those unions out to vote, whereas the disability community is not unionized and it's not organized. So it, it, because it's not organized, it's, it's, it could be very difficult to be able to attract their vote unless you continue to throw money at them. But if it's not a big enough community, then you know politically there's no gain for them to do that. Yeah. Well, I. That's what's going on. It's, yeah, exactly. I I found old um, and I challenge any listener out there to do this. I found old uh, election debate uh, footage of. Um, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Kim Campbell, like different videos, right? And I noticed right. all the election stuff, they're always talking about the same thing. The high cost of living and blah, 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 and our plan's going to create jobs. Yeah. So if it's been repeated for the past almost 50 years, what makes people think they know what they're doing, Right. Well, I think the biggest problem that we have in this country from a from a, an election point of view is a lack of understanding of economics and how an economy works. Exactly. So, and so because they don't understand, most the average person does not have any interest to, or any has put no effort in understanding how an economy actually works, how wealth is created, how a standard of living improves. Because they don't understand that, they they believe in the they believe that the politicians somehow have magical. You know, powers to be able to influence the uh, they put the standard of living for everybody, but they don't. The politician is a middleman. The politician is simply a broker and a very expensive broker. Yeah. And they broker votes using your tax dollars. So what they basically do is they, they take money out of out of your pocket. They spend that money on the political groups that will get them reelected, and they pay themselves a very high wage, extremely good benefits. A guaranteed pension, a defined benefits pension plan, and they are the only ones who get that in today's society, because yeah. the government has given it to themselves. They give themselves the best, uh, you know, um, employment package of any that exists out there when you compare it to comparable jobs in the private sector. Yeah. So that's what they're doing. They're basically feathering their own nest, but they're giving you all kinds of of, of uh, hype. You know, and spin uh, to help to make you believe. Because if you don't understand economics, you're going to believe the spin. Yeah, I I agree. Like I'll admit, I don't 
you know, I'm learning about economics, but some of the stuff they talk about, and I, I totally, I totally believe this is on purpose. When they talk during elections, they always use uh, complicated explanations. They don't make it easier to understand. 20 minutes into the election, you're trying to remember, or 40 minutes into the, the election uh, debate, you're trying to remember what they said 20 minutes ago. You know what I mean? Right. And like, well, do you know that there are three there, there are three schools of economics? Did you know this? I've heard are you aware of the three schools. Do you know? I've heard. Should that, I explain them to you? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. That'd be great. Okay. So there is the there is the London School of Economics. The London School of Economics uh, it came up uh, came about through John Maynard Keynes. So you hear this guy named. This form of economics called Keynesianism, and it's based on John Maynard Keynes, and he was famous. He wrote a very famous economics book in the 1930s. Uh, it was a it was a um, a popular book. Mm -hmm. He was beginning to advise the political masters in England at the time, which is where he lived. Then he was invited to the United States during the Great Depression, and uh, he talked to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt loved the idea of Keynesianism. And Keynesianism is simply this. It, Keynesianism gives a very important role to the government, to the central governments, yeah. to influence the economy through government spending. So the idea was they borrow money, they spend like crazy, they make public works projects like building highways and bridges and dams and that kind of stuff, and they put people to work when the economy is weak. And that was the, that was the thinking behind it, to stimulate the economy when it needs to be stimulated by putting the government into debt so they could spend the money. But the theory was also meant to be that when the economy was strong, then the government would pay back that debt. It would pay it down because now the economy is producing, there's better tax revenues, and they would take that money and turn it back into the, the, the debt that they'd accumulated. But that never happened. Mm -hmm. The next school that came along was called the, the Chicago School. And that came about in the 1960s and 1970s, and they the leader of that was a guy named Milton Friedman. So Milton Friedman was a very, very famous economist from the University of Chicago. I've Milton actually seen Friedman his interviews. Sorry. Sorry? Uh, I said I've actually seen his interviews. So if anybody wants to go check okay. them out, they're all over YouTube. Yeah, he's, he was quite a famous guy. He lived to uh, age 93. I think he died uh, about 12 years ago or something like that. Yeah. I've read some of his books, um, but he was a monetarist. So, so this is a, another way that the government can play a role. And they, what they do is they control the money supply and they control the interest rates, and they do it through their central banks. Mm -hmm. So, in the United States, they've got the Federal Reserve banking system, and they're the ones who set monetary policy for all of the United States. And they set, they, they, they decide how much money should be circulating in the economy. They decide that the interest rate should be to stimulate the economy. And so the, the Bank of Canada does exactly the same thing. And the Bank of England does the same thing. All the Western banks in the world are central banks that, that, that they control the money supply, the interest rates in the money supply. And if by doing this, they can also stimulate the economy at times when it needs, when they think it needs to be stimulated, and they can, they can dampen the economy when they think that the economy is overblown or overheated. So that was Milton Friedman. The third school and the oldest school is called the Austrian School of Economics, and the Austrian School goes back to the late 1800s. Mm. And back then, there were there were people who were writing uh, about um, economics, where the government was not playing any kind of a key role in spending or in managing the money supply, and they were basically supportive of the free market economy. Even money itself, uh, the, bar the value of money was actually determined by the free market. It was not determined by public policy. And so uh, we went on, like on the free market system, for many, many years until about 1917, where in the United States the Federal Reserve Banking System got started on Jekyll Island. Uh, there's a really great story on that. If you go to YouTube, it, you, you can find a great story on Jekyll Island and the history of how the central banks of the United States came about. But basically, I'm a believer in the Austrian school. I believe that the government should have 
a minimum role in, 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 a, in economic activity, and maybe no role, in fact, in economic activity, but I'll be kind and say maybe there's a minimum role for them. Yeah. Uh, but I, think, I believe in the free market, and I think that the, the people who criticize the free market don't realize that we don't have a free market anymore. We used to, but we have nothing but a regulatory, regulated economy, with mm -hmm. government getting heavily involved in spending and managing money supply and interest rates, and that is not a free market by any stretch of the imagination. So anybody who tells you that the free market doesn't work yeah. is somebody who has no clue about what the true nature of a free market economy is, mm -hmm. and that we do not have one today. Well, I here's here's something kind of interesting. Um, and I, I wonder if it would apply to if I was able to get a hold of anybody in regards to not increasing the minimum wage. But I mean, it really made me wonder when I got a hold of the woman uh, for the ministry in my area, and I told her like right. we need to get a hold of the 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 politicians because if you're going to increase minimum wage, then as much as I hate government. Uh, being involved in, in stuff like this, the, like I explained to you privately, the, this program and the work I do has saved my life. Because as I stated before, yeah, I, I, I see it being very valuable for you. Pardon? I really do. I see it as what you're doing is very valuable for the community. It's it's a, it, you should be doing lots and lots and lots. Of, hopefully, you'll do this for the rest of your life as a career. I want to. But what you learn and the value you will be able to give back to the communities of, of people that see you and talk to you and hear things like this, yeah. that will be an invaluable service for our democracy. So yeah. keep doing it. Don't stop. Um, Find a way to make it happen. Well, when I got a hold of the woman from the ministry, I said, like, I called the people that are in charge of the program first. I said, you need to let the other right. clients that use this program know about the funding that won't be increased because this program can also be used for children with disabilities so some parents use it to hire someone to have their kid for the weekend and, and do baking with them maybe do their physiotherapy with them um and, and right. I, I know when i was a kid i used to look forward to like every friday my knowing that my physiotherapist was going to be there and after i did my homework we could maybe do some uh, some baking or some video games. It was something to look forward to, right? So I told them, we need yep. to let the other people know. And the woman from the ministry told me, Steve, you can't get a hold of Mark. I can't get a hold of uh, of the, the people right now because um, it's summer. And I'm like, well, we need to let them know. And she's like, well, you can't because you're going to scare them. And I said, scare what? She's like, you're going to scare the other clients that use this program because um, it's just going to scare them. She couldn't really answer me besides saying that. And I'm like, what? Scare them with the truth? They of need to not. know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do, do, you really expect, do you really expect somebody who's working as a clerical person at the government to actually be knowledgeable? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I told her, I said, look, because she said, well, we can't do the letter. I said, look, I'll do the letter. I'll send it to the, to this other guy, Mark, and, and I'll send it to you. You, I'll, I'll write at the top that this is on behalf of uh, other um, passport users, and I'm just writing this letter to let other people know. And she still said, even though I offered to write the letter, she still said, no, I can't, I can't do that. And I'm like... Okay, so, so, so Steve, let, let me help you, okay? I'm going to give you a strategy. You ready for this? I'm listening. So here's what I would do if I were you, all right? Yeah. If I were you, I would look at... I would try to figure out which of the two political parties is most likely to form the next government. Is it going to be the conservatives or is it going to be the liberals? You have to make, you have to make a gamble, make a bet. So I would say that between the liberals and the conservatives, it would probably be the conservatives. Yeah. All right? So that's my bet. So the next thing I would do is I would call up your local conservative member of parliament or your, your representative. Call his office up. 
and just say, tell them your story. Say, I'm a person with disability. Yeah. I am doing something that's highly meaningful for me. And I've got a person who I'm working with that works with me that I pay $10.40 an hour, which is the minimum wage today. Yeah. And I'm getting subsidized for that. And it's enabling me to do something that's productive. And then say, but Kathleen Wynne's policy of increasing the minimum wage is going to take away a chance for me to do meaningful work. Yeah. And the, the, the conservatives will use this. They will use the, your story. And they will take that story to Patrick Brown. And Patrick Brown in Queen's Park will say, here's what's happening with your minimum wage. Here's who you are hurting. Here's the story of Stephen up in, up in, uh, up in Sudbury and, and how it's hurting him. Yeah. That's what I would do for you. I'd, I'd get the politicians to fight this in Queen's Park. That's a good idea. Because I've tried the so what I know. I, I've tried the media. What and I know of is I already know Patrick Brown is in favor of increasing the minimum wage, but he will not increase it anywhere near the level that Kathleen Wynne will. Yeah. So, so he's thinking at more. The very least, at the very least, Patrick Brown might suggest that people with disability will be exempted. Yeah. Business owners with disability will be exempted from the policy. I would suggest that is that you can't, you know, if you can't get uh, them to roll back the minimum wage, then they can certainly make an exemption for people with disabilities. Yeah. That's something the public would buy. Yeah. Well, for anybody that for anybody that stumbles on this video, if you're a passport user, I would recommend like like I said, for me, I got a hold of the woman, then I got a hold of another guy named Mark that manages the program, and Find out who manages the program in your area and and explain your story too because or like I'm just saying this to anybody that might stumble on the video that uses the passport program for themselves or their yeah. child. So that's what I did, that's what yeah. I recommend they do. But yeah, I will I will look up this uh, I'll I'll look up Patrick Brown and, and uh, get a hold of get a hold of him. Now is he a conservative or a progressive conservative? Well, oh, Patrick Brown is the leader of the, of the, the Progressive Conservative Party in Ontario. So he's the one who's running up against Kathleen Wynne. Okay. You may, you may have difficulty reaching him, so you need to look up who is the Conservative candidate in Sudbury. And, oh. and get a hold of him. Find out who he is. Yeah, they just talked about him, actually. So, he's a local... Uh, he's a former hockey player, um, and they were just talking about him not that long ago, so... Um, yeah, I'll have to look that up. Well, why, why don't you ask him if he'll be your next guest on, on this, on this program? Yeah. Get to the home. Offer him something. Yeah, I could do that. Um, yeah. I, this to me is something that you should be fighting for. And, and if you're going to try to go through the government process, you're going to waste an enormous amount of time mm -hmm. because you're just going to get a run around yeah. because the policies are the policies. And no one's going to bend the policies for you. Yeah. Well, it's it's true. There are three hundred and sixty. Uh, there are currently three hundred and sixty thousand regulations that the Ontario government is responsible for today. Do you really think that anybody's going to go look for that regulations that's going to affect you? Yeah. Exactly. Within the government, do you think they're going to do that? I don't think so. <laughs> no. No. And like. That's why you want to get the policies for you. Hmm. Well, they, they, when I talked to her um, and then I talked to Mark, both of them said the same thing. They were like, well, do you have, like, uh, can you get involved in developmental services Ontario? They'll get you out of the house more. They'll do, I'm like, no, I, getting out of the house is not the issue here. That's not what I'm talking about. Right. They tried to make it like, oh, right. you're, you're just, you need to be more active, so... And like they completely tried dodging the the uh, the whole story and the whole thing already. So, and I find. Well, it tell them what you're doing. Tell, tell them that you're building a business. Did you did you look at the Tom Woods show that I told you about? Pardon? You know the Tom Woods show that I, I told you about? Did yes, you I see did. Any yes, I did. I looked at so all. You got to keep watching them. Because you want to keep building your business around the Tom with the model, really. Yeah. And you got to tell these the, the, the conservative politician that you are 
You are learning how to build an online business, yeah. and you're listening to Tom Wood Show, and show you the Tom Wood Show, and so that he knows what this is all about. Yeah. And it says, it says that Kathleen Wynn's policy is going to prevent me from building an online business. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a person with disability. I don't have a lot of options. So for me to build an online business where I can do it from my home and have workers come to my home, yeah. you know, this is the only way that I'm going to make a positive contribution in society, and you're stopping me from doing that. And frankly, that's a story. That's a story that would hit front, that would hit front page news. I've tried contacting. Okay, so here's, so here's what I will do. I, I've written a lot of letters to the editor in the National Post in the past. Yeah. So I'm going to write a letter to the editor about you, about Mark. I won't say your last name. I'll say you live up in uh, in the northern Ontario town. I'll tell him that you're, you're, you have a disability. Yeah. You're, you're trying to build an online business. You've got stu a student for help at the minimum wage. And now that the minimum wage is going up, you will no longer be able to make a positive contribution and build an online business. Okay. Cool. I'm going to write that letter. All right. Cool. Okay. That sounds good. And I can Thank see you. Maybe I I can send another version to the to the uh, the Toronto Star. I can send it to the Globe and Mail. You know, in other words, your story is important. We gotta get that out. Yeah, because I mean, I, you know, there's no shame in living on disability. I didn't, I didn't ask for it. Uh, um, my nobody asked. Stephen, to, I'm not even concerned. About, I'm not even concerned about your disability. I look at Stephen Hawking, and yeah. I see what Stephen Hawking accomplished with his disability, in spite of his disability. Yeah. It, you've got a brain, and your brain is functioning just fine, and you're and you're figuring out a way to build an online business, yeah. and that's a very good thing. So you're doing what you can do, and uh, you know, and, and as a libertarian, I support that 180 yeah. percent. You know, that's the way it ought to be. You know, and yeah. government regulations should not be stopping you from moving forward. Yeah. But they are. Oh yeah, they are. This is this, this is a crime. This is absolutely a crime. Thank you very much for the, the passion and the understanding, that's for sure. Um, well, it's what I think. It's really what I believe. Yeah, but but the, the one thing I want to end on is, um, now you, you explained everything about economics, but what would you say uh, to my, like, do you, what would you say to my friends that tell me I don't get it um, and, and um, the cost of living is too much, and we need the minimum. We need the minimum wage increase. I would argue that uh, I tried to tell them that minimum wage is just a band aid solution, like I stated earlier. But they just they don't get it. So you did give me a while back when we first uh, met each other. You did give me a way to explain it to them. Um, so. How would that be the best way to explain it to them um, so that they listen to this video later? Okay, well, I don't know how, I can't remember how I explained it last time, but I'm going to explain it uh, uh, the way I would explain it as a professional recruiter. So just so you know, for 35 years, yeah, I have placed people in jobs. I, I've been interviewed tens of thousands of people. Yeah, I've placed people in jobs. I did it on a 100% commission. I had no salary whatsoever for, th for 28 of the 35 years, okay? Yeah. So I'm an entrepreneur. And what I used to always tell people is that your economic value in the marketplace is not determined by regulations or laws. It's determined by your, your ability to make a contribution, a positive contribution to an employer. Yeah. And if you cannot produce for that employer enough economic value to at least cover the cost of hiring you, then he has no business case of hiring you. He has no business case of keeping you. Yeah. And so the, the key thing about getting paid well is to continue to improve your skill sets, your productive capability, but you do it in relationship to a particular job or a job market that you want to build your career in. It's got to be an ongoing activity. It can't, it's not something you do one day or one week. It's an ongoing activity. Yeah. We live in an age where there's constant change. Technology is changing around us. Our society is changing around us. Our culture is changing around us. And this is only going to accelerate. And unless your friends 
understand that this is what's happening and begin to prepare themselves for the changes that are coming and the changes that are occurring now, they're going to get left behind. So rather, so rather than expecting a politician to put a number on their forehead, $15 an hour on their forehead, and say, this is my price tag, like shopping in a, in a grocery store, rather than doing that, forget about the, the, the politicians and forget about their red tape and their bureaucracy and their rules and their regulations. Focus on yourself. Focus on trying to find the ways of improving your value to an economic market that's willing to hire you. And that's as pure and simple as that. Yeah. Well, that is, that is pure. And the other thing I suggest, by the way, is there is one book that's a very simple book on economics that everybody should read. In fact, I would, I would make it a textbook in high school. It's called Economics in One Lesson. Hmm. Economics in One Lesson. Okay. It's, it's a book that we've been recommending as libertarians for a long, long time. It's very simple. Your grandmother could understand it. It's, it's something a, a grade 11 student could understand. It's not complicated. And that would be the book that I would recommend all of your friends to read so they understand how the economy actually works. Where, where can you, I'm assuming like, like Amazon or anything? What was that? Yeah, you get that on Amazon. It was written in, 19, in 1949. It was, it's been around for a long time. Wow. But economics and how an economy operates doesn't change. I mean, the technology that drives it changes, but the actual rules for economic transactions, they don't change. They've been going on for you know, hundreds of thousands of years or as long as human beings have traded between themselves. Yeah. Well, I've, le- I've, I've learned a lot. Trade. It's just an exchange. Yeah. Well, I've, le- I've learned a lot and I'm learning a lot as, as a, as a um, libertarian and I'm proud to call myself uh, a Ontario Party member and uh uh, as well as federal now too within the past week, okay. so um, the the one thing that we can do at the at the very at the very most, if we can't get anybody to join the party like through these videos, then if we can at least open their minds to what actual liberty is and what actual freedom is and free market then we've done our jobs as far as I'm concerned. Would you would you say that too? Uh, yeah. Like I say, if you can win even one person over to understanding how the economy truly works and who will fight for a, a non-governmental, limited government uh, mandate that the libertarians have, non-governmental options, I should say, because we, we believe in a limited government and we believe in reducing the number of government services the government offers and make them available through the private sector. Mm-hmm. It's possible to do that. So, you know, well, the one thing I'm going to suggest to you, Stephen, is I want to see you succeed in this. Yeah. And I want to encourage you to do more and more work with uh, the Tom Woods show. Listen to that and learn. Yeah. And at the same time, I've also written a number of papers. I've um, written a lot of stuff over the years. Okay. And so I can talk to a number of topics that are in, in the, uh, the public sphere. I can talk to healthcare. I can talk to education. From a libertarian perspective, so if you want to have future interviews on those topics, I'm more than happy to oblige. All right, well, greatly appreciated, and it was great talking to you. And uh, um, I'll be reaching out again, and I'll, as soon as I edit the little couple of blips I made there, um, <laughs> I'll be sending you no the problem. I'll be sending you the video, and I'll be posting it on the uh, Growing Libertarian. Uh, Facebook group and for anybody that's listening join the group but you have to be um, in it for now the settings are set up where um, you have to be 18 to join the group because I I do that and I'm I'm gonna specify right now to the listeners why I do that the reason I do that where you got to be 18 to join the group is I don't want parents coming to the Facebook page or the YouTube channel and saying you're trying to corrupt my child. Once they're 18 and they can start to learn this stuff on their own, then that's you know that's their individual choice. So, uh, and also, I would also apply that thinking to religion. To which? Religion. Exactly. Exactly. I would not. I would not. I would not um, teach a child 
uh, religion until they were 18. Yeah. That's another topic, though. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So I'll, uh, I'll talk to you another day, and thanks a lot, and uh, we'll be sending you the video. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. Okay. Have a good evening. You too. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye. Okay.